Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break all evil and sin that binds us. May in this service be cursed as before all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, ignorance, all of this, let it depart from the tents of your holy people. And so, stand, Lord, in the place of your rest, you and the ark of your greatness, and may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, and allow us to find your holy countenance. I present this service into your divine arms. Guide it with your uplifted hand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated. The book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 45 through 48. So that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The sermon that I would like to continue is called, Called to Perfection. In fact, these words are turned to Christ and to a commandment, which is the inheritance of saints of all times and generations, and is addressed by Christ to his disciples. And therefore, those people that do not accept the person or the authority of the person sent by God have no relation whatsoever to the inheritance of this commandment and likely will never have a relation to it. With regard to the fulfillment of this commandment, to be vigilant over the word of God in our heart, just as God is vigilant over his spoken word in the temple of our body, we arrived at the need to study the following question. What specific goals is the righteousness of God in our hearts called to, per called to pursue? And, in particular, on the fact that the purpose of the righteousness of God in our heart, accepted by us in the Brooklyn Tablets of Testimony, in which we, with the law, died to the law, so that we could receive justification in new Tablets of Testimony, in order to live for the one who died and rose, and therefore, in doing so, receive the affirmation of our salvation in the new tablets in order to give God the basis to give us the promise to be an heir of peace, not through the former law, but through righteousness of faith, just as he had given to Abraham and his seed. For the promise that he would be the heir of peace was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13 And therefore the covenant of peace in the heart of a warrior of prayer is the result of the obedience of his faith to the faith of God in the word of the messenger of God. It is through righteousness of faith that the covenant of peace presented in the inheritance of peace is called to keep our thoughts and our thoughts in Christ Jesus. So, observing these commandments places our thoughts in Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
the fruit of righteousness in the atmosphere of the peace of God because this peace of God is given to us in a seed and we then need to grow it into the fruit of peace because the fruit of the Spirit, there it is mentioned that there is peace. This peace, well, as we say, Everything that God gives us through the preached word, He gives to us in the seed, in the format of a deposit. We accept it, and we can accept it under the condition that our heart is cleansed from dead works. Then our soil becomes good. It is capable of accepting this word. And then to grow it, to grow it into fruit. Therefore, this is referring to the fact that if a person does not grow it into fruit, then he cannot use anything anything from the grace of God. He will lose his salvation quite literally if he does not grow this salvation into the fruit of righteousness and which are the components of the peace of God. And therefore, it is the fruit of righteousness shown to us in the atmosphere of the peace of God that is able to keep our thoughts in Christ Jesus. This is the glorified seal of God on our foreheads that serves as evidence that we are holy unto the Lord and that we belong to Him. And this seal of God is found on our foreheads in spiritual thoughts that are the mind of Christ in our spirit and that are the mind of Christ in our spirit, as it is written, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. According to these words, it follows, that people who refuse the conditions to submit their faith to the faith of God, in submission to which the preached word and power of the Holy Spirit is called to renew their thinking with the spirit of a mind, they have nothing in relation to the peace of God. And they have no relation to the sons of peace, so the priests of God inherit eternal salvation in the kingdom of heaven, of whom it is written, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Who are these Antichrists or those that resist Christ? From where did, where did they come from? This is not the world. It is said, they came out from us, but were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest, and none of them were of us. So they grew all on one field. As wheat grows on one field with the tares, the wheat is sowed by the Son of Man, the Jesus Christ, or the preached word of the messengers of his messengers, and the tares are sown by the emissaries and mammon on the same field. When the disciples asked, who did this? He said, the enemy of man had done this. But they said, allow us to go and take them out. He says, how will you take them out? A tear does not differ from the wheat. A wheat does not differ from a tear at first. When we are born from the seed of the word of truth, our spirit is reborn. Our soul remains the same. Our body remains the same. And therefore, we don't differ in this moment from the tears. We need to place into circulation our salvation, our justification that we have received in the seeds, that we can receive it in the fruit of righteousness. And the fruit of righteousness is the seed, the seed of the wheat that will demonstrate itself in humility. When upon the wheat field there is the mat maturation of the wheat, then from the weight, the head of the wheat begins to begins to uh, begins to weigh down. But the tear is uh, is empty. That's why it stands up straight. I saw these I saw these tears. I had observed this. Uh, the wheat. Um, you can see that it's wheat. But when I had broken in pieces the the tears, you can see kind of like this black black dust. But there is no there is no seed. Where does it come from? I asked the farmers, where where do tares come out because you sow wheat? They said, this is a mystery. Science can't explain this, why tares come up. We, we sow wheat, but something happens, some kind of metamorphosis. Along with the wheat, there appear tares. And at the same time, he says, we'll take a look at mushrooms. Each mushroom has a forgery. There are healthy mushrooms, and there are those that are poisonous. 
and they copy, for example, that there is a white mushroom and there is that which copies this white mushroom. There are different kinds of white mushrooms that could be poisonous. Satan tries to copy, even in nature he tries to copy. We see this, everything that fills, there is a copy of it. There is an oak tree and there is something that looks like this tree, but if you draw near it that this is a poisonous leaf, there are poisonous leaves, poison oak, and a lot of people, they have allergies against it, allergies to it. And therefore, these people, these people that resist the order of God, why do they resist Christ? Because they say, I have my own head and I have my own Bible. Well, when they preach, these preachers, they oftentimes like to say, my Bible tells me this. I say, oh, where have you gotten it that this is your Bible? This is the book of God. This is not your Bible. But they think that this is their Bible. The Bible is the book of God. It is not our book. We are called to place it into our heart. But where have they taken this phrase from? I asked one preacher before, why do you continually repeat this? This is not from you. You've gotten this phrase somewhere. You don't even understand where you've gotten it or what you proclaim. You think that you are, you say, my Bible is, says, says this, and you swirl your Bible around. Scripture says that these people have no relation to the sons of peace who through the peace of God inherit eternal salvation in the kingdom of heaven. It is specifically through this peace. These people constantly have dissatisfaction. They don't agree with something. Everything, uh, they, the song is not right. The psalm is not right. They constantly have something to, to, to say negatively about. They don't want to humble themselves, prepare their hearts to hear the word of God and to come and listen to it. The most important thing is to direct your attention to hearing the word. The rest of everything, all of these other all of these other things must be abolished. We must focus ourselves on hearing the word. And we must understand firmly that through the cooperation of our spirit with our renewed thinking, renewed thinking appears only when we, with the law, die to the law in the body of Christ. And then our soul dies. It dies in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our spirit dies in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We receive it, we receive a reborn spirit, and then we must immerse it into the death of the Lord Jesus for our soul. The spirit does not have the need or the necessity to be in the death of Christ. He already is born from his resurrection. But our spirit will not receive its salvation without the soul. This is the whole essence of it. Our spirit will not receive its salvation. The reborn spirit will not receive it without the adoption of our body through the redemption of Christ and without the salvation of our soul. That's why already toward the salvation scripture says, save your souls. And in order to save your soul, it's necessary for the spirit to take and along with the soul to be immersed into death. And as soon as it rises in resurrection, because God says, I I give life to the hearts of the contrite and humble spirits. I give life. And when he gives life, our mind is already not, not fleshly. It is renewed by the spirit of our mind. And therefore, only through the cooperation of our spirit with our renewed thinking, because it, our spirit cannot cooperate with a not renewed thinking. They are going to resist, just like the two kings and one government, just like King Saul and King David in one government. I have explained why God allowed in one government for there to be two kings, maybe perhaps three, but right now we're going to talk about specifically two, the fleshly mind and the mind of Christ and the face of King David. David was beloved by God. Saul, he was his name at great, great. He placed himself great. Why did Apostle Paul refuse to be called Saul? Saul means, uh, Saul means great. And he said, I am Paul. I am small. So he humbled himself. He had, refu he had rejected his name and took a completely different name for himself that talked about the fact that I have bowed my head for Christ so that I I could refuse everything in order to gain him. 
And therefore, only through the cooperation of our spirit with our, with our renewed thinking that is found in Christ Jesus, we are called to reign the resurrection of Christ in our bodies and clothe our bodies in the resurrection of Christ. And therefore, according to what signs should we test ourselves to see if we have the reign of the peace of God in our heart, which identifies us as the sons of peace and as holy unto God? Because according to the reign of the peace of God in our heart, which cannot be violated, but would not be destroyed by any losses of life, neither death nor any losses nor illnesses, they cannot, uh, they cannot abolish this. A person who has peace will never ask, well, why am I sick? He'll never ask this. He will never ask, well, why is he or she sick or why did God allow this because he or she, they loved God. Why did God allow this to happen? This is spoken only by those people who do not have the peace of God in their hearts. He does not reign in their hearts. These are carnal people who consider themselves spiritual. These are still carnal people. And carnal people, they always think that their children are saved. Remember, carnal people... Your people, your your children are not saved with your salvation. When scripture says you and your household shall be saved, it is referring to when you place the salvation to circulation and you receive it in a fruit. If you have received it as a fruit, your salvation, then your your children will have the guarantee for salvation. But if you have not received it in a fruit and your building has burned down, then your children do not have the right to this same salvation because it is says you and your household, you accept salvation, but if you do not place it into circulation, you lose your salvation. And if God does save you as a head from the fire, then this does not mean that your children are going to be saved as a guarantee. Each of your children needs to individually save themselves rejecting your life that you had lived, that you had died and did not grow the tree of life in the fruit of a meek tongue. You did not change your character. That's why salvation, salvation is accepted in a sober mind. If a person loses uh, sobriety and then you tell him about salvation and he accepts it, this is not the acceptance of salvation because he accepted it not in a sober mind. Salvation is accepted in a sober mind. Remember this. And so, only according to the reign of the peace of God in our hearts, we must define in ourselves if we are the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So, peacemakers are those who have the peace of God ruling in their hearts. In a certain format, we have already studied six signs according to which we can judge and define that we are sons of peace and therefore sons of God, and we have stopped to study the seventh sign. This is our ability to clothe our essence into the holy or selective love of God by way of proclaiming the faith of our heart. The words that are proclaimed by us, if they are the faith of our heart, they begin to clothe us. If they are not the faith of our heart, they also clothe us. But some clothe us into the true love and others clothe us into lies, into a forgery. So in um, in this world it says, be kind, you must smile to him and be kind. A lot of people think this, but scripture says something on the contrary. It says, you must love this person and fulfill the commandment of the Lord, not be based on your feelings, but be based on the commandment of God. If the commandment of God says, you must do this and this and this to your neighbor, although this neighbor perhaps seems far from you, because you have different views on hobbies and other things, you consider him uh, that is... He want to be friends only with those that are of the same level of intellect as you. But we must find people whose level of intellect is not like ours. And we must do good to them. I, in my life, in my youth, I had paid attention to these people who were rejected by others in the church. These were always people who were always rejected. In what sense? They were never invited 
there were certain groups that they constantly gathered and they were never invited to others and they always with hope looked they couldn't invite to themselves but if they invited no one came to their house and when I was invited I always said I am not alone if you invite me then these people if they you invite them then I'll come with them so in order to have me over at their house they would say all right take them as well they wanted to have me in their in their among them because God had given me a, a special grace and they could feel satisfaction in my presence but I always invited to supper these people specifically that no one else wanted to invite and when the guests had come and if I saw that no one was invited them then I would go up to them and I would say has anyone invited you okay I will invite you please come over so I have I've gotten used to this and my heart always suffered for these people that were rejected if you are taught or you learn to love in this way, this means that you have the peace of God in your hearts. We are based on not what we feel, but on what we know. This does not mean that our feelings are going to not be present. This does not mean this at all. This means that our feelings are going to follow after us. They're going to follow after us. Not long ago, we sang a psalm. And in this psalm, the words were changed because the, of, I want to live according to you and breathe by you. This song was written by the person who led his emotions after him. And someone fixed this psalm. I ask you to not do this without my initiative. Please ask me, can I change the words or not? That's why we need to return all the words back. And so in a certain format, we have studied six signs, and we looked at the seventh sign, the love of God. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And therefore, we know that in Scripture, God's selective love is presented by the Holy Spirit in Scripture in the light of seven unearthly dignities and properties through the preached word of the apostles and prophets. This is virtue, knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly love, and love. This is a property of one fruit. This is not an individual fruit, but the property of one fruit. Just as you take a pear, apple, cherry, there are many ingredients in them. This is a special, these are special ingredients that comprise the character of God. And when Christ has come, he demonstrated the character of God. And when Philip said, Lord, show me the Father, he said, I am, I've been with you for so many years and I'm not with you. Do you not know that I am in the Father and the Father is with me? So he, in this way, had demonstrated who the Heavenly Father was. How the heart of the Heavenly Father Acts. Take a look at how the heart was of the Heavenly Father towards the rejected in Israel, toward the sinners. There are those that struggle from their sin and they want to, they want to exit. When the woman that was sinful, adulteress, they said, Moses had commanded us to uh, stone her. What will you tell us? He bowed down to the ground and said, Who without you is without sin? Who among you is without sin? Cast the first stone. And these people, whose conscience had dimmed out, all of a sudden the word was uh, was restored by, by Christ. And they then began to lead, beginning from the elders, going to the youngest. And then they remained one-on-one, -on -one, Christ and the woman who was accused of adultery. He asked her, Woman, where are your accusers? No one has accused you? She said, No one, Lord. He said, And I will do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Do you know what kind of sinners whom God does not condemn, who are in the captivity of sin and who do not want, or who are unable to get out? He justifies them. And even if they are in the captivity of sin, they fall. He says, Get up, 
and go forth again. I will teach you how to resist this sin and how to overcome it. You cannot overcome it on your own without me. Victory is found in my death and in my resurrection. You must die in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in my death with me. And when you die, your sin, your soul that has this sin, it is going to die. And when you arise, you will arise without this sin. And then the old man, the old man that is in your body, will lose authority over you. You are going to be able to bind him, and you are going to be able to withstand sin and trample on it. And therefore, we've already looked at five pro five of the properties that open for us an entrance into the kingdom of heaven, and I've stopped to study the sixth property, which is brotherly love. And with regard to this, we arrived at the need to study four classic questions. What does Scripture say about the origin and essence of brotherly love, which we are called to demonstrate in our faith? What purpose is the love of God agape that flows from brotherly love called to fulfill in the demonstration of it in our faith? What conditions are necessary to fulfill to receive the power to demonstrate brotherly love in our faith? And by what signs should we test ourselves for the presence of the demonstration of brotherly love in our faith? Given that the first two questions have already been the subject of our study, we have arrived uh, at the need to study the third question. We must keep in mind that these conditions are components and do not work without one another. The first condition, giving God the basis to pour out His love in our hearts, is our decision to be born from the imperishable seed of the preached word of truth. It is this decision and the desire to know and fulfill the will of God that follows was known by God before the creation of the world, which gave God the basis to reveal His predestination about us so that we may be in the likeness of His Son. Because this news, not everyone will hear it. And it is going to be spread, the spread about salvation, about the deliverance of sin. Any atheist, I retract, everyone will, will, everyone will hear of this. As one writer said, a Nikrasov, he was a Russian writer, he said, the soul of a person, according to its nature, is Christian, is a believer. It is here in our heads that we are atheists, he writes. But in fact, I knew many atheists that had secretly try to serve God, to worship Him. They had uh, tried to obtain Bibles for themselves. They were people that held high ranks in the hierarchy of the communist parties. And at the same time, they placed the gospel under their pillows. They read the Bible. They secretly brought the priest at home. They paid him money to baptize his, their children. Therefore, atheism is foolishness, is a foolish, foolish faith. That's why in schools, when it is uh, the Darwin theory is taught, atheism is also taught to resist the Bible. And today, in all countries of the world, the government, they withhold the mystery about the biblical origin. You know that in all countries of the world, in all countries of the world, there are thousands of lessons and they say that people uh, are not they did not come from monkeys they came from giants but in museums this is forbidden to be demonstrated yesterday i watched a report from all countries of the world of those people who had partaken in these uncoverings uh, these was in armenia and kazakhstan and iran in america in russia so in the digging in the in the digging they said I took, I, I found a bone, and this bone of this person was uh, taller than me, that these people, they were from four and a half to six meters in height, and there were many of them, many of these bones discovered, and the cities are uncovered, but the, why? Until this point in museums, this does not exist. Everyone is told, we have come from, from monkeys, because you'll never see a monkey that is six meters in height. These are small, this is a small creature. Satan laughs and mocks at these people they they uh, accept these in schools those people that call themselves Christians in America 
and uh, penetrate this Darwinism theory. Even Darwin himself had rejected it. He studied, studied it, found out that he was lost, and he rejected it, just like uh, Engels, when he had created these uh, this communist ideology, creating it along with Marx Marxism. He had then rejected it. How come nowhere is it spoken of? How come? Uh, penetrating this lesson of atheism, they don't talk about these people, how the people that created these lessons rejected them. Engels wrote that he was a historian, he was a, an archaeologist, and when they were, there were scrolls found, ancient scrolls found, and dug up, there was the, uh, the letters of kings toward one another, and when he had read this, he, he said, People are trying to change our our minds towards certain things in history, specifically about the fact that the one, the one who loses life, who had lost life in Golgotha, once again had gained it. He had believed. He had believed in Messiah, the Christ, just as Darwin. But those that resist Christ those that resist God, they continue to leave the world uh, an unknown. Sometimes we have so-called school, school children, they say, I don't believe in God because his cheap science, he's been brought by cheap science of Darwinism. So the second condition, giving God the basis to pour out his love in our hearts in the atmosphere of brotherly love, is to demonstrate salt in our faith, which is the presence of the fruit of holiness grown by us. In Scripture, salt is an image of holiness. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, so and a salt loses its its flavor, a person out of holy, a person becomes wicked. A wicked person cannot be a person of this world because a wicked person is one who was previously holy, who had salt in him. He was holy. He was born of God. He had in himself the seed of this of this holiness, of the salt. But instead of offering the fruit of holiness, he had buried it in the ground. He had buried in the ground that which he had, and he did not place it into circulation. He turned himself into the wicked. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Matthew chapter five verse thirteen. This is also written in other books. According to the revelation of, of Scripture, the presence of salt representing the property of holiness is grown in the process of our total dedication to God, which was preceded by total sanctification, which made us a coastland surrounded by the cleansing waters of sanctification. On, on all sides. In scripture, coastland is always an image of a holy person who is washed by the waters of sanctification that is separated from another land. Same thing here. Dedication to God makes us salt. And dedication is when you are laid upon the altar because it is specifically the representation of our body into a living, holy, and acceptable sacrifice to God for reasonable service that clothes us in the dignity of the fruit of holiness that makes us the salt of the earth and defines the soil of our heart as good or wise. For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Because if you have salt, you will have peace, and if you have peace, you are going to have salt. When this, uh, the word and, uh, salt and peace, this word and means that they are walking together in under one harness. If you have salt, you are going to have peace. If you have peace, you are going to have salt. I am referring to the peace of God, which Scripture is referring to. And therefore, despite the fact that all sheep by nature are pure animals, only the sheep that is separated for a burnt offering sacrifice becomes holy when it is separated for a sacrifice. Holy means separated. He is separated for a sacrifice on the altar of burnt offerings. 
And this is when we make our decision. Scripture says, therefore, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It is we ourselves that must present our bodies. We must make the decision with the law to die to the law in the body of Christ. And this means that we must die to our nation, the house of our Father, and the corrupt lusts of our souls, so that we can receive our soul in a new in a new way, in the resurrection of Christ, where it is going to become the belonging of God, hallowed unto God, through the lips of which God is going to practice wonders. He is going to clothe us in the fruit of righteousness. And therefore, if our sacrifice comprised of our prayer intercession is not offered upon the alt- fire on the altar of burnt offerings in order to be seasoned with the fire of holiness, we cannot have the right to intercede as priests of God. And consequently, we cannot have the legal status for the right to enter into the presence of the Lord. And therefore, these people, they can pray however long they please, and they pray long. And I know people that pray uh, for hours in tongues, and the more they pray in tongues, the further they grow from God. Because Scripture says, Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Tongues, without knowledge of the truth, will not make you free. It will make you religious fanatics. This is what it will do. But when you know the truth, it is going to make you free. And having been freed, you are going to pray in tongues. And then he will have its a correct application. And then it will have its correct application. Holiness is a state of our heart that discovers itself in the correct words of prayer, which are followed by actions that turn upon us the favor of God which our emotions are led by. Our emotions, they might ignite when our horse has acknowledged its master. So when our renewed mind has been made a prince, and then our emotions fall in love with him, they ignite. This is fire. And then, this is a completely different feeling. The feelings of a carnal person and the feelings of a spiritual person are two differences. A spiritual person receives information, and from this information, his emotions then ignite. A carnal person, he does not accept this truth. He considered it as foolishness. He is constantly based on his own feelings. And he has not bridled these feelings. He serves them. It's not the, his emotions and feelings that serve him, but he serves they. He serves them, and these are two big differences. And therefore, holiness is a state of our heart that discovers itself in the correct words of prayer, which are followed by actions that turn upon us the favor of God. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You see here, we see the word and. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. They are united. We can't have holiness without peace and peace without holiness. And therefore, the attempt to demonstrate peace outside the limits of holiness, so to have communication with people outside of the limits of holiness, because holiness forbids us to communicate with certain people. And you say, well, God loves everyone. You proclaim tolerant love in doing so. And therefore, I remind you that the attempt to demonstrate peace outside of the limits of holiness and not as an expression of holiness transforms us into the sons of resistance and sons of perdition. It, ter- it transforms us into antichrists who are not going to be able to withstand it in the house of the righteous. They will find a reason to leave. They will create their own synagogues and they will proclaim themselves as spiritual and they will, pr- they will uh, call you uh, heretics as those who are delusional. The demonstration of holiness and prayer is a demonstration of righteousness of faith that affirms our origin in God, giving us the right to make a covenant with Him, which is the covenant of everlasting peace. When we make a covenant with God in the functions of the three baptisms, water, Holy Spirit, and fire, we make it in the seed. And now we need to, in this covenant, we need to grow. We need to offer fruit of righteousness. Only then will the treasure of the covenant become ours. We will have the right to the 
to the treasure of the covenant until we grow into the fruit of righteousness, the seed that is given to us in justification, then the treasure that lays in the covenant cannot be ours. We cannot use it. Only holy people have the legal right to represent the holiness of truth upon fulfilling their sanctification that pursues the goal of dedication for the living and true God. Let's be reminded of what a holy person is. What scripture means when it talks about the uh, holy brethren. When apostles turn to the church, they call uh, the holy brethren. They say, you must do this and this and this in order to become holy. No, they already call them holy. They call them holy and then they say, you are fleshly, you speak in tongues, you use gifts of the Spirit, but you are carnal, and I could not speak with you as those that were spiritual. I could only speak with you as those who are carnal in Christ. You see, these fleshly carnal people, they are still holy. Why? Because they have been born of God. God cannot give birth to someone that is not holy or not righteousness. But having given birth to someone who is holy and righteous, He gave birth to them in a in a deposit in order to become so according to their right. Our new man must grow, and He must overcome our old man. We must cooperate with Him, and we must grow the fruit of righteousness. That's therefore that's what holy means in relation to the person who was born of God. He doesn't need to do something in order to become holy and righteous. He is so according to his origin, born being born from the seed of the word of truth. So they acknowledge that they are born from the seed of the word of truth, but they do not acknowledge that they are holy and righteous. In the Orthodox Church, righteous, you become righteous very rarely, a rare, rare priest. If he has died and then passes 40, 50 years, and if his body and then they then these people are worshipped and they think that these people are going to do wonders take a look at how far people are far off from the truth I remember I brought one monk in the church a pastor came to him and began to to they say you worship icons and idols I say what are you what do you worship what do you worship? They okay. They worship idols and icons. You also worship something, but not God, because you can think that you must become holy. This means that you do not worship God. You do not acknowledge God that He has given birth to you as holy and righteous. You try to by way of your works to be made righteous. Therefore, you are not worshiping God. You also have your own idol, and it is far worse than the others. Therefore, holy is he who is born of God, he who is born for God, he who comes from God, who belongs to God, who dwells in God. He is the property and holiness of God, redeemed by God, set apart for God, dedicated to God, like God, entering into the portion of God, this is referring to our new man, and sharing in the authoritative powers with God. This is what God has laid or placed into a covenant, a covenant that is firm for people who have entered into a covenant with Him. And they must grow in themselves the fruit, the fruit of righteousness, in order to have the right that is found in the covenant. The word holy yields the inner state of a person born of God, making our heart identical to God's heart. While the word holiness is a manifestation of this state, which expresses itself in words and deeds of holiness, which serves as proof of our belonging to God and our origin in God and from God, which gives us the right to warriors of prayer in the dignity of kings, priests, and prophets, and gives God the basis to incline heaven toward us in order to turn His favor upon us. Uphold my steps in your paths. So, you see here, David understood that his steps are not yet aff affirmed in the paths of God. It's necessary for these steps to be firm. It's necessary to uh, to establish them. The ways of the Lord are found in the covenant. He says, uh, establish me in your 
covenant so that I can use that which you have placed on your covenant. Establish my uphold my steps in your paths that my footsteps may not slip i have called upon you for you will hear me O god incline your ear to me and hear my speech so god inclines his ear toward those who incline their ear to the preached word therefore in scripture the phrase incline your ear to me used in relation to man toward god means to listen carefully to the man that prays to make your eyes good toward the man that prays, to become a refuge for a warrior of prayer, to become a cover for your warrior of prayer, to take up a perimeter defense around a warrior of prayer, to put the enemies of a warrior of prayer to flight, and to hit the enemies of a warrior of prayer. In order to give God the basis to incline his ear to our prayer, it is necessary to present God arguments of our origin. In the offering of the fruit of holiness in the atmosphere of brotherly love as well as outside of it but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of god when have we been freed from sin when we with the law died to the law by the body of christ when we in the baptism of water holy spirit and fire were immersed in the death of the lord jesus and in these baptisms we made a covenant with god a covenant of blood salt and rest and therefore, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end to everlasting life. So this occurs only with those people who have rejected their nation, their household, and their corrupt desires, and they have been immersed into death. And there are very few people like this. Therefore, from the existing definition, it follows that until a person is freed from sin by taking off the old man and considering himself dead to sin and alive to God, calling the inexistent power of incorruptibility in his body as existent, he cannot become a servant of God in order to demonstrate the salt of holiness. And in order to grasp the essence and the difference between the definition of holy and holiness in relations between man and God and one another, it was necessary for us to answer a series of questions. First, what is it and what does it present and how is the characteristics of God's love determined proceeding from brotherly love? Second, what purpose is holiness called to fulfill in relations between God and man and man and God? What price is necessary to pay in order to demonstrate the fruit of holiness and brotherly love? So, in brotherly love. And by what sign should we test ourselves for the presence of salt, which yields holiness in relations with God and one another? In a certain format, we have already studied the first two questions, and we will turn to studying the third question. What price is necessary to pay in order to demonstrate the fruit of holiness, which is the foundation and atmosphere for cooperation with the holiness of God and the atmosphere of brotherly love? Demonstrate the salt of holiness is the vocation and calling of a holy person. And for the fulfillment of this role, it is necessary to pay a price expressed in fulfilling the holy commandments of the Lord. The fruit of holiness is a legal field for all forms and levels of relations of God with man and man with man. So our communication with one another in brotherly love. On one hand, the price of the right to demonstrate holiness will be multifaceted and multifunctional. And on the other hand, there are no price reductions on the price for the right to demonstrate holiness. There are not going to be any kinds of sales. In a certain format, we have already studied five components of the price, giving us the power to the right to demonstrate the fruit of holiness in our faith in the demonstration of the love of God that dwells in atmosphere brotherly love, and therefore we will turn to studying the sixth component. The sixth price is comprised of accepting correction from God as consolation. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. Take a look. Chastening is a correction. It's not an illness. And it is not destruction, it's not a loss of something material or spiritual, it is correction. 
Do not be cast down when God ch- ch- uh, chastises you with correction. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. God understands that correction is a rod, but he also knows what this rod does. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have been made, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we pay them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. So he used correction as a rod, so that we can partake with him in his holiness, so that we could begin to practice holiness. We have paid attention on numerous occasions to the fact that a, ch- a chastisement from God is referring to a format of correction in which God, out of his love toward us, pours out his light in order to protect us from perdition. All the rest of the trials, which we often call the Lord's punishment, are nothing more than either suffering for the truth or retribution for a sin, because of which it has no relation and cannot have any relation to the chastening of the Lord towards His children, which is defined as the correction of the Lord. Because each gift is good and each gift is perfect, it comes from the Father of Lights. You see, there are no illnesses, destruction, and punishment that comes from God. If there is a correction, then this is light. He reveals, and you see that you have behaved yourselves incorrectly, that you need to humble your pride, that you need to acknowledge this, to agree. And you can't. In your head, you understand that you are right, you are correct, that pastor is incorrect, everyone is incorrect, only you are correct. You don't want to submit until in your mind you understand that's what Scripture says and what Pastor says. And you will never understand it. You need to simply acknowledge the authority. Just as a small child acknowledges the authority of his father, he says, I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that. He takes a rod and says, okay, well, now you're going to want to do it. And after being disciplined, a child wants, he says, okay, if I don't do this, then I'm going to be disciplined. And if we have feared our parents, then we must uh, fear our Heavenly Father. They had punished us, they punish out of love, so that then when uh, our independent life comes upon us, we can understand that we must withhold ourselves from certain things. If we allow a child to be disciplined and do not uh, punish him, and we do not withhold him from certain things, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, then when he grows up, then the police baton is going to, to, to hit him. If you don't want the police baton to hit him, then take a rod and contrite his ribs. This doesn't mean to break his ribs, but to break ribs means to, to, to break his pride. Meaning, I don't want this, I have my own will. Children begin to say, I don't want to do this, or I want to agree with this. But you humble them, and Scripture says that if you do this for a few days, your Heavenly Father will do this so that you can partake in His holiness. The reason why the children of God perceive their correction of the Lord in the form of loss of their health or some other physical punishment for sin lies in their carelessness and ordinary illiteracy of the language. Quite often, the same word in scripture, translated by translators from the Greek language into the Russian language, in the original Greek language, because neither English or Russian is the original of scripture, Greek is the original and Hebrew. In the original, sometimes even in one text, it has a completely opposite meaning. So in one text can be two words that have a completely opposite meaning out of an incorrect translation. For example, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved or tested, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Furthermore, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted, tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. 
So take a look. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, because having been tempted, he will receive the crown of life. And this also says that God does not tempt. We'll take a look here. There is opposition here. People don't even notice that this opposes each other. And when you see this opposition, you need to look to the original text of Scripture, because this tells us that there's an incorrect translation when there is this opposition that exists. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved children. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Jim, James chapter 1, verse 12 through 17. God is not going to attest a person with evil or tempt a person with evil. Do not be deceived. Now let's take a look at these phrases. The phrase, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been tested, he will receive the crown of life. The word approved, translated from the Greek language, means tested. So blessed is the man who is going to be tested. So when there is a a clay pot that is created, it dries up, and then it is put into the fire for a certain time and at a certain temperature. And when it is taken out, he slowly it slowly cools down. Now you can pour water in this in this vessel, oil, and it's not going to come apart. It's not going to melt. It's going to keep for thousands of years that which you place in it. Today, when some uh, pots in which there was honey or wine held there, when they are found, they are found in that same state. They have not been ruined because they were in this in this clay pot which was placed into the fire. Now when it comes to the temptation, not about the testing, but the temptation by which a person is tempted, being carried away and seduced by his own lust, the word temptation in the same Greek language means to try to seduce and catch into the net, and as a now means the tempter. So take a look. We catch ourselves into the net with our own understanding. We try to find in Scripture a place that would allow us to sin. Do not drink wine from which there is dissipation. We do not want to discern. We do not want to look to the original. Do not drink. They People think that they can drink a little bit. And they comfort themselves. And I'm just bringing an example. One pastor, I said to one pastor before, here the word do not be filled has three meanings. Do not be filled means do not use, do not be satisfied, and do not drink a lot. Why did you not take the first two definitions to not drink and to not be satisfied, but you took the third definition, that which was um, necessary for you. Do not drink a lot. Take a look at what it says further on in Scripture. Do not drink, be filled with wine from which there is dissipation. This means that when you allow yourself to drink a little bit, you allow yourself to drink a little bit of dissipation. This is the first thing. First, second thing. Do you consider yourself a priest unto God? As a pastor, he says, yes. And I say, do you know that priests who go to service unto God, they do not have a right to to drink any any wine or grape juice. He says, you caught me. I tell him, how much do I need to chase you and you're going to play hide and seek for me? I always wanted to try to help him understand, but he always wanted to show me many things, not just these, but other other things where he wanted to, with Scripture, to show that this must be in this way. He considered it that pastor could only be his sons because he is a priest and only from him could be pastors. And I said, you know, in the New Testament, all of us are priests. All of us are called to be kings and priests in the New Testament. And pastor must be that person whom God selects. If you are a pastor and you understand that the time of your leaving uh, departure has come. You must pray to God for Him to show, show who will, who will, who will remain. And He whom He has showed, He will reign. If this is your son, great. If this is another person, then praise God. And you must not focus only on your sons, and so forth. And so I repeat, when it comes to temptation, and this is referring to, in the Greek language, the attempt to catch ourselves into a net. 
and the noun is the tempter. God is not a tempter. Take a look in one place of scripture. How do we study it if it opposes each other? First, there is blessed is a man who endures temptation, who has been tempted, but then the fact that we are tempted ourselves and that God does not tempt us with evil. Why? Because there is an incorrect understanding and translation of these of these words. See, already, only in this one place of Scripture, there's a big difference between when God corrects through the truth, which is His light, in which a person sees his deception and gets the ret- opportunity to repent. And when we ourselves are tempted, deceived by our own lust, the result of which is sin and suffering that accompanies it. It follows from this that God, through his correction directed to his children in the format of his mercy, shows us the way out of the suffering, which was the result of the deception of our own lust. So, the correction of God, the rod of God, is merciful. It is mercy. It is not comprised in ill, of illnesses. It is not comprised of the loss of something, of the destruction of something. Absolutely, it does not. It is not comprised of this. It is comprised of correction, and this is merciful. And this correction can be in the format of instruction, because it uncovers light. For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it in a dream and a vision of the night when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Man is also chastened with pain on his bed, but this illness is not from God. So when God, uh, when a person uh, does not agree, for example, in Israel, when they not agree to be under the, the shadow, on the protection of the, fire, the pillar of fire, they then uh, uh, Amal- Amalek had killed them. Same thing here. A person, he begins to be chastened with pain that comes upon him. Not every illness is a punishment for sin. Sometimes there are illnesses that are suffering for truth. Sometimes there are illnesses in which the, which a person must endure. He must endure in order to grow his faith. That's why I don't think that any illness is the result of sin. When the disciples said, Lord, who has sinned, him or his parents, that he was born blind, said not him nor his parents, this so that, so that the works of God could be, could be manifested through him. So why? Why when we are ill, this man who was blind, he was in the state for a long time. This was so that his faith could be affirmed because he knew Holy Scripture. And when finally he had heard about the Messiah, he ran to him. And he said, have mercy upon me. And he said, what do you want? What do you want in order to be able to see? See, your faith has saved you. So faith in my word. Therefore, it is written that man is also chained with pain on his bed and with strong pain in many of his bones, that his life abhors bread and his soul succulent food. His flesh was a waste away from sight and his bones took out which were which once were not seen. Yes, his soul draws near the pit and his life to the executioners. If there is a messenger for him, a mediator, one among a thousand, so this angel, this is talking about apostle, about the person who has the fatherhood of God. He has the seed. Not every people have this, not every person has this. In many churches, this is simply, this is a face that is selected by a democratic route, that according to their intellect, their spiritual gifts, that is far lower than those whom they selected him. They, uh, in the beginning, first accept a person who is of a low intellect, who does not understand scripture. He is going to... They are going to control him. They're going to tell him what to do. And he is not going to depart from them. He's always going to say, brothers, what shall I do? He is always going to gather the brothers and ask them what to do. And the brothers are going to decide. But then he is go- and then he is going to say that the brothers have established. He's going to speak the decision or the word. He's going to say, the brothers have established us to give birth. Well, forgive me, God did not establish us. This is not a commandment to give birth. This is a blessing. And God had blessed them and had given them. And he said, 
multiply, uh, you produce a multiply. Not long, not far away from us, there is a Pentecostal church where the brotherly council, they had gathered and the pastor had commanded and said, announced, the brothers have established to give birth so that the woman could give birth and so that there are no forms of, uh, there are no forms of protection that are used. And this is not a commandment of God, though. Commandments do not say, commandment says, if you eat of the tree, this is death. This is a commandment. It says, if you are not, it does not say that if you do not, um, if you do not give birth, you will perish. Eat as much as you need, and then the rest do not. Here I'm talking about the messenger. He has a messenger for him, a mediator, one among a thousand, to show man his uprightness. Then he is gracious to him and says, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. So it turns out that only through this person could we receive freedom from sin. If not, then the body will be made young like a child. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray to God and this is referring to as a parable about what will happen in his spirit because his spirit was wounded, not just his his body, but his spirit. He had lost communication with God. And now his body will be made younger like younger like a child. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray to God and he will delight in him. He shall see his face with joy. For he restores to man his righteousness. He will look at people he look at men and say, I have sinned and perverted what was right, and it did not profit me. He will redeem his soul from going down to the pit, and his life shall see the light. Behold, God works all these things twice, in fact, three times with the man to bring back his soul from the pit, that he may be enlightened with the light of life. Give ear, Job, listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will teach you wisdom. It says what God says to Job through through another man. This uh, this man was the messenger, the mediator for him. There were three friends that had to come, but it doesn't say that there was a fourth one there as well, the angel, the mediator, who said to him, Speak to me, I am young. This is the fruit of his spirit, the image of the fruit of his spirit that began to give him knowledge. It says, you always want to fight with God, and now the fruit of the spirit began to speak with him. And now, be silent before me. Listen to what I am going to tell you. And then if you paid attention, then correction in the format of mercy is given only to that category of people who recognize the power of the word of a person who, who is vested with the authority of the fatherhood of God, whom God has established over them. And nevertheless, if in our life God allows a certain kind of shock and suffering, we should not blame God for this, because by accusing God of seeming injustice to us, we thereby convict God, instead of humbling ourselves before Him and giving place to His correction. More would the Lord answer Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. The Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. So Job had repented in that he asked, called God out for judgment. For what? For what? For what? Instead of enduring it quietly, we begin to scream to God and say, Lord, for what is this? We come to pastor, we say to one another, for what? For what? This means that peace has not reigned in our hearts, and when peace does not reign, we say, all right, Lord, I will not do this anymore. So he continued to uh, be sick. God did not take the illness from him, but peace reigned in his heart. He said, all right, Lord, and the, and the illness had still plagued him. And then God says to his three friends, my anger is upon you that you had said about me as I am not faithful. As only when he prays for you, then I will accept, I will forgive you. And they came and they asked Job for forgiveness. And when Job had forgiven them, then God had healed him, so that you understand. 
because he had bitterness towards his three friends. God could not heal him due to his bitterness, not just because he with God had um, challenged God, but because he had was bitter. Yes, they had behaved incorrectly, but these are your friends. These are your neighbors. These are your neighbors. You cannot have bitterness against your neighbor. Yes, they might not be correct, but you can't carry this resentment. Before the setting of the sun, you must forgive them because you have taken their righteousness and they are they are naked. And if we forgive people their transgressions, then our Father will forgive us our transgressions. If we do not, then God will not forgive us. You see what the Holy Spirit has shown here. And therefore, to better understand the value of chastisement in the format of correction, which is a manifestation of the Lord's mercy and is sent to us exclusively as His children, I will give five definitions that determine the value and purpose of the Lord's corrections addressed to us in order to save us from death. First, the correction of the Lord is one of the formats of instruction in the way that leads to eternal life. He who keeps instruction is in the way of life, but he who refuses correction goes astray. Proverbs 10.17 This is talking about how this instruction, this instruction is a format of correction. And whoever keeps this instruction, the format of correction, he is found on the way to life. He has not yet entered into this life, but he's on the way to this life, just as Job. Job, when he accepted correction, he was on the path to life. But when he had forgiven, when he had forgiven, then he finally gained this life when he had forgiven his brothers. Considering that the corrections of the Lord in the format of instruction are sent by God through a person vested with the authority of the fatherhood of God, the reason why a person rejects the corrections of the Lord is the arrogance and pride of his heart and his mind, thanks to which he rejects the authority of the messenger of the Lord in favor of their own opinion. So they say, what what could be uh, we can receive from pastorally spiritual things and the rest are not if I from the pulpit say something accept it as a spiritual thing if I said according to revelation from the Lord that vaccines are the secondary work or of word of God this is a revelation of God accept it as a spiritual thing but if you resist this will be as perdition unto you this is just one of the examples when we saw that a part of people just exploded. They exploded. They did not accept this. Let, let him talk about Christ to us. I am talking about Christ to you. Scripture characterizes people that rely on the power of their own intellect who give their intellect power through the intellect and uh, through the internet and by looking at different television channels scripture characterizes people as ignorant who refuse to show holiness and obedience to the words of instruction put by the holy spirit in the mouths of the messengers of god whoever loves instruction loves knowledge but he who hates correction is stupid Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. Second, the correction of the Lord pours out light on the ways of the Lord, called to lead a person out of the way of perdition into salvation. Harsh discipline is for him who forsakes the way, and he who hates correction will die. You see, a harsh discipline is for him who forsakes the way, and who hates correction will die. So he who forsakes correction. Forsaking the way of the Lord is a result of a person's hatred of correction. Scriptures say that he shall perish. And again, forsaking the way of the Lord is the result of a person's hatred of correction, or the refusal of a person to be a disciple of Christ in the face of a person sent by God. Third, the correction of the Lord is the format of counsel that comes from a person clothed in the powers of the fatherhood of God called to God called to make the person receiving instruction wise listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days proverbs 19:20 so here, correction, the format of instruction will make a person wise, not right away, but in the, in the latter days when he accepts this correction. Fourth, the correction of the Lord in the mouth of the messengers of God through time will find more favor with the corrected person than with the person who flatters with his tongue. So in the beginning, when a man of God corrects, 
than a person when he is uh, when he is resisting this then he begins to have distaste toward that person what scripture says that when a person understands that what this is who this person is for him then this person he will find more favor than the one who would flatter his ears or, or flatter with his tongue he who corrects a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with the tongue so he who corrects will find more favor there will be more favor and inclination toward that person who who had meditated and who had thought in himself about that person, about the parables, Christ says to one and the other, go. One says, all right, Father, I will go. I will go work in the vineyard. And the other says, I do not want to go. Why do I need to go and work in the vineyard? I have my own will. I don't want to do this. Then both of them having walked off, the other one, um, he pondered in himself and he said I will go and the other one the one that thought and the other one that pondered and said well why am I going to go if he doesn't want to go Christ says who among them filled will the father he who said I did not want to go but did go this is talking about these people so first our mind goes in front of us and then we begin to to meditate in our heart and say or to ponder in our hearts and say why did I explode this is pastor and if he is speaking then in his words is the Lord this is his word he isn't going to speak from the pulpit he's not going to say anything that is of himself this is of the Lord why did I uh, why did I resist this fifth the correction of the Lord found in the lips of the reasonable parents refers to correction in union with the rod the rod and correction give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 7, 29, 15. So if we, for our children, do not use the rod when we correct them, because you say, do not do, but he, but he, he still does. And then when you discipline him with a rod, only then will he fear and not do it. That's why correction should be for children with a rod up until a certain age and for older people a rod is correction itself because when they accept with love correction from the pastor then they're going to be in a blessing and usually that correction that comes from pastor it always comes out of love of God and God through him always tries to protect us from death to protect us from falling into the pit that's why the goal of this correction is in order to protect us from perdition amen let us bend our knees bow our heads and may the Lord bless us in this prayer amen we wait for you at the altar so that you could confess your sins here before the countenance of God to confess your dependence on your lusts or on sin or your fears. Today there are many fears and God will bless you. I will pray along with you with your prayer and I ask you 
to deeply believe that God is for you, He is not against you. Pray along with me. Your eyes closed as an element of a mystery room, and your hands raised to the heavens, a sign that they are without anger or doubt. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you. I uncover my heart. You see my pain that is brought upon me by sin, my lusts, my lusts. I despise evil. I despise sin in my body. I reject it. According to your word, I consider myself dead to sin and alive to you. I call the inexistent power, the power of life in my body as existent. And right now, before heaven and hell, I want to proclaim that according to your word, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am healed, I am restored, I am justified, I am saved. Your sins are forgiven and your transgressions in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May He come down upon you with His holy countenance. May He have mercy upon you and may He give you peace. May among you fall thousands and tens of thousands among you, but not draw near you. May upon you fall the blessings of the ancient hills and everlasting mountains. And may all this come upon you and upon your descendants, and may it be fulfilled upon you. And let the people say, Amen. Blessed is God that in each service that is called the service of justification, we have the unique opportunity to fully be freed from sin, to be freed in such a way as it does not have a result in us, because God blots out this sin from His memory, and you must also blot it out, erase it, and know, not feel, but know that right now God has freed you from sin. You are no longer slaves of your lusts and in your desires. If you do consider yourselves dead to sin, and if you do proclaim this with your lips, God is going to clothe you in such a stronghold that you are going to trample on your lusts, on your desires, and you are going to see the kingdom of the peace of God in you upon all losses in life, and your bodies are going to be prepared for the adoption in order to receive the argument for rapture. And now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present you before the presence of his glory and joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen